And that's where you had the famous uh, foul of uh, 35 times, you fouled it off. Uh, I, don't, I never counted, I don't know how many, but I know that it was set a world record. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Des Moines changed a bit, hasn't it, since you... Yes, I was just telling when we came in here, just coming in from the airport, everything looked so natural that yeah. I was a great surprise. I just, in my mind, I was going to yeah. go to 914 Walnut. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I was wondering whether we'd be in uh, the studio on the, on the right or the one on the left. <laughs> right. Well, we got a new building here. Yeah. All right. Got some lovely weather with you. Oh, yes. And we'd been hearing for days and... Uh, you got much news today? Thank you, partner. You got much news today, H.R.? Much news? No. Yeah, but you haven't, huh? My name is Jim Zobel. I've been sports director of WHO Radio since 1944. And obviously, we're honored and excited today to have the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, who sat behind his microphone on many occasions from 1933 to 1937 when he had my job. He was sports director here at WHO. President, great to have you here. And of course, your friend and a great friend of WHO's, Charlie Gross, H.R. Gross, the former news director here. Yes. Now, the memories that this microphone right here evokes in you, what are they? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, there are so many. It's, it's like a film montage there of everything. The various events and the... Uh, I remember probably one outstanding occasion, the microphone of that kind, out at uh, Birdland Park. And they were having the Olympic tryouts mm -hmm. out there, the AAU tryouts for the, for the Olympic team. And we were feeding network going to feed the NBC network, and that was really tops. For going. We had a half an hour to fill. And some of the Olympic officials got in an argument. And I was on the air for 30 minutes nationwide, <laughs> and they did not run off one single swimming event. I think I described every drop of water in the pool, <laughs> everyone that was warming up, and what they were doing and talking about what events were going to be held, went off the air, and two minutes after we were off the air, they had the first event. But your ad lib ability really was put to a super test with that machine right there, the old Western Union ticker tape that used to bring in the Chicago Cubs recreations yes. to you. Yes. And you had a stick one time in that famous story, you fouled it off 34 times, <laughs> 35 times. Yes, it was, you sat, there was a window here. Curly Waddell was the operator, sat on that side, and, uh, with the headphones, and he would type and slip it under the window to me. And they used to keep track because there'd be seven or eight stations competing and broadcasting, mm -hmm. and most of them live right at the park. And we were within a half a pitch of right up with the live ball game all the time. Sure. To do that, he had to abbreviate things down. Like, in would come the paper, and it would say, out, four, three. Mm -hmm. Well, that meant out from second base to first base. That meant it had to be a grounder. So you'd take it and you'd say, and, and Dean comes out of the windup, and here comes the pitch, and it's a hard hit ground ball down towards second base. So and so going over after the ball picks it up, puts it over to first just in time for the out, and by this time you're waiting for the next one. Mm -hmm. Or he would send you S1C, mm -hmm. and that meant strike one call. So <laughs> you'd say, He's got the sign, comes out of the wind-up, here's the pitch, and it's a call strike, breaking over the outside corner just above the <laughs> knees and all of that. But the thing that you're talking about was the time that, it was the ninth inning, the Cards and the Cubs, tied up 0-0. Zero, zero. And he was typing, and I thought there's been a play coming, and he kept shaking his head when I had, and it was Dean on the mound, mm -hmm. and I had uh, Billy Jurgis at the plate. And I had him getting his sign from the catcher, and finally, here comes the slip of paper, and it said the wires have gone dead. And I knew in that ninth inning, if I suddenly said, well, we'll have a little interlude of music while we get back connected with the ballpark, we'd lose every, they'd all turn on some of those other stations. So I thought there's only one thing that can get in the, doesn't get in the scorebook, foul balls. So I had Jurgis foul one, and then I had him foul another, and then I had him foul one that missed a home run by a foot. Then I described two kids down back at third base that were in a fight <laughs> over the ball that had gone into the stands. And pretty soon I know I'm beginning to set a world record for somebody standing at the plate and hitting successive fouls, if anyone ever kept those figures. 
And I was beginning to sweat a little because I knew now that if I told them we'd lost the wire, they'd know I wasn't headman telling the truth. You finally did get the hit in that game. Well, just pretty soon, Curly started typing, and I had him throw another pitch, and in came the slip, and then I started giggling. <laughs> I had trouble getting it out because the slip said Jurgis popped out on the first ball pitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Charlie Gross, let's bring you in here. You were known as kind of a meticulous perfectionist at the time. He was a young sportscaster. Did he live up to your standards when you were here? A young sportscaster? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You kind of made him toe the line? the source of all sports news around here, uh, that is, by way of radio. This gentleman here is the president. Yes. Did you project in him at that time when he was 22, 23 years old? The qualities that enabled him to become president of the United States? No, never. He was Democrat. He belonged to the wrong party at that time. But, <laughs> yeah, but I outgrew but, that. Yeah, but he outgrew it. That's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, oh, I uh, never thought, of, of course, that he would become president of the United States uh, and that I would be here by his side tonight. Mr. President, uh, this microphone brings back, you were selected Wheaties Sportscaster of the Year one time. You did a Wheaties yeah. commercial, you did the Kentucky Club Yeah, they, they sponsored an awful lot of, uh, of uh, baseball, Wheaties did. And when you yeah. came into Des Moines today, uh, down Fleur Drive from the airport, uh, did you notice some changes about the city of Des Moines? Well, along about the time we got here, by the time that I got here, I was just prepared to turn right and go to 914 Walnut Street. And uh, <laughs> here I am in a whole new institution. I've got to tell you one about I want to hear Johnny one Gross. that you got on him. Yeah. Well, let me just tell you, he is a pioneer and a true pioneer. Under the um, uh, Fair Trade Practices Act back in those Depression days, radio was not allowed to do news. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it would be unfair, they thought that you could just go and put it in the microphone instead of having to have it put in print and out on the streets. And B.J. Palmer, who was then the head of the Central Broadcasting, decided that he was going to challenge that and we were going to have news. Mm -hmm. And only one news service would provide us with a news wire. And Charlie was the whole news department, including the writing and rewriting of the stories, and we went on the air with news, and it was a first in radio that, uh, and became a, a daily, twice-a-day feature for his news. And, and uh, then, of course, he was a pioneer in another thing, as you know. When he went to Congress, mm -hmm. it was no surprise to those of us that knew him that he would be known as the conscience of the Congress, that his colleagues would go to him because they knew he had read the bills, and they'd go to him before they voted to find out. You were being overly generous. No, I'm <laughs> not. Okay, yeah. Charlie. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you told me when I did an interview with you in 1974 on the 50th anniversary of WHO Radio that the five years you spent here were five of the happiest years of your life. Do you oh, still yes. look back on those that fondly? Oh, yes. They were really, those were foundation years. And I think everything that ever happened came out of, uh, came out of this. Well, it's the true American uh, hero story, hitchhiking to Davenport, I believe, to yeah. get the job in the first place. Yes. <laughs> Had a rather unusual audition uh, from Pete MacArthur, who was the program director yeah. then. Uh, I had been told that in looking for a job in those depression days, and I'd hitchhiked all the way around the country quite a bit, mm -hmm. I'd been told that you should ask an employer not for what you wanted to be, a sports announcer. Yeah. Just tell him you'd take any job to get in the st station mm -hmm. and then take your chances on moving up from there. So I made my usual pitch of that kind after a number of turndowns to Pete. And this time, the turndown was really disappointing because he said, where were you last week? We auditioned 90 people and hired an announcer. And on my way out the door, I said, how do you ever get to be a sports announcer if you can't get in a station? And went on down to the elevator, which fortunately wasn't there. And Pete, who was badly handicapped with arthritis mm -hmm. and on two canes, mm -hmm. I didn't know until I heard him thumping down the hall yelling at me. And he uh, asked me what that was I said about sports. And I told him that's what I'd like to be. And he said, uh, you know anything about football? And I said, I played it for eight years. He said, do you think you could tell me about a game? And if I was sitting there listening, I could see the game. And I said, I think so. 
And he took me in a studio, put me in front of one of these. Mm -hmm. No, they weren't even this one then. <laughs> this was a modern one. Yeah. This was the old carbon yeah. mic. Right. Uh -huh. And he put me in front of that, and he said, when the red light goes on, you start broadcasting an imaginary football game. And I did for about 15 minutes. It wasn't really imaginary. I knew I had to have names. So I picked a game that I'd played in college the year, the previous mm -hmm. fall, and uh, which we won in the last 20 seconds by mm -hmm. uh, a 65 yard touchdown run. I did not make the run. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I chose that game and said, when the light came on, started that we were in the fourth quarter. And oh, I had everything. I had the long blue shadow settling over the, the field. The famous long blue shadow. Yeah, <laughs> chill wind coming in through the end of the stadium. We didn't have a stadium, we had bleachers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did it for about the 15 minutes and made that winning touchdown. One thing I did put in, as a running guard coming out around and leading the interference, on that play that day at Eureka College, mm -hmm. I missed my man, the first man in the secondary. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how Bud Cole got by and reversed the field because I missed him. In the broadcast, I nailed him. It was a <laughs> magnificent block. <laughs> Key to the whole success of the play. And uh, he came in and told me that to be there on Saturday, that I was broadcasting the Iowa-Minnesota game, and he would give me $5 in bus fare. <laughs> the price hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying that facetiously. Well, Mr. President, obviously we're, we're just thrilled and, and happy to, to have you here to reminisce about the old... Well, let me ask you one question for sportscaster to sportscaster. Would you have stayed a sportscaster if the telegram had not come from Warner Brothers, do you think? I think so, yes. There's always been a sneaking lust in my heart for the <laughs> okay. theatric end of the of the business well we have uh, about eight to ten thousand people i think a, a, a full house waiting up at the auditorium uh, can you tell us what you're going to tell them up there tonight well i don't think anything that i say is has been said by any of the eight other candidates who've been running around the state <laughs> i might have a little different twist on things than that but i'm going to talk about this recovery that we have going and what I think is needed to keep it going. How does it feel to be back in Des Moines? Oh, great. It's, it's too short as always, uh, but uh, give me another seven and a half minutes and I'd be so far down nostalgia lane. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you one question a lot of people ask of me about you. What type of sportscaster were you? I mean, how do you categorize, uh, categorize your style? What, uh, what was it? Oh, I don't know. I always thought, I always had in mind uh, of a listener out there, and I thought that I was painting a word picture. Uh, if I was in the stadium over at the University of Iowa broadcasting uh, an Iowa football game, I always tried to use references like uh, uh, saying not just that they're on the 20-yard mm -hmm. uh, line, 15 yards in from the side of the field. I would say they're down here to the right. Uh, on their own 20-yard line, 15 yards in from the, this side of the field, or place them. I always figured that he, in his, that viewer uh, out there, he or she must be able to, to get a picture in their minds of what it, what it looked like. Well, you gave them a lot of pictures, Mr. President. I'm thrilled uh, to have you here. On listen, WHO I've rambled today. on, but you shouldn't have turned <laughs> me loose. <laughs> well, the fans love it, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Good luck to you tonight. Well, thank Congressman you. Congressman Gross, thank you for being here with us. Not today. at all. Pleasure but to see you, sir. Thank you.
Republicans. Take your time. 